Thank God for chapter 4. Let's look at just a little bit of it just before we go to lunch. You know, Dr. Jung told Roland that ideas, emotions, and attitudes. That's what we're going to be looking at now. Ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which are the guiding force of the lives of these people, are suddenly cast to one side. And certainly the ideas, emotions, and attitudes that I had toward God were that of a seven- or eight-year-old boy. I couldn't accept it then. I couldn't accept it later. And I couldn't accept it when I got here. And I can't accept it today. Because I need new ideas and emotions and attitudes about this. New information is what I'm trying to say. This chapter, we agnostic. Just the word agnostic means something to me. Gnostic means knowledge. You put the ag in front of it means without. Those are us who are without knowledge. And that was me. And the knowledge that I did have was not good. And Bill had the same experiences that we did. When, when Abby presented him with a solution, he was aghast at that solution. Some of us are aghast at that solution also. And Bill said that whenever they talked to, to me uh, of a God personal to me, he said my mind became irritated and snapped shut against such theories. And certainly that's the way that I did. Later on in the book it says to us that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. The spiritual malady. The understanding of God of my understanding. When that is straightened out, we're straightened out mentally and physically. And this chapter here, we agnostic, is an attempt to do that. And as Father Bill Wilson, some of you know Father Bill, said to us many, many times, and I love it, he said that this chapter is not put here to teach me that there's any particular type of religion or type of God. He said this chapter is simply put here so that I might read and question and wonder and get some ideas, emotions, and attitudes, new ones, and open up my mind to a point that God might prove to me there's a God. Now, with that understanding of this chapter, it means more sense, makes more sense to me and becomes extremely valuable in my life. In the preceding chapters, you have learned something of alcoholism. We hope we've made clear the distinction between the alcoholic and the non-alcoholic. If when you honestly want to, you can find that you cannot quit entirely. Because the obsession... Or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take. Because of the allergy. You are probably alcoholic. God, isn't that simple? Isn't that simple? You see how people like to expand on things? They took the two questions out of the big book, and some years later they made a little pamphlet that had ten questions in it. And that wasn't enough. They made another one that had twenty questions in it. Hell, I think we're up to 44 today, aren't we? Yeah. Thank God Bill or Abby didn't have the 44 questions with him when he walked into Bill's kitchen. He just said, Bill, has alcohol been bothering your reputation? <laughs> Hadn't had a reputation in years. Then he would have said, Bill, has alcohol been interfering with your sex life? Is anything like I was, he hadn't had any of that in a long time either. There's a statement in the 44 questions that says, do you drink alone? Well, think about it. If I'm buying, yes, and if you're buying, no. (laughs) We had an old friend that used to live in Tyler, Texas. His name was Wino Joe. I've always felt sorry for everybody in AA that didn't get to meet Wino Joe. He was a real character. He's dead now. But Wino Joe had made up his own list to ask yourself to see if you're alcoholic. And the first question on his list was, has the roof of your mouth ever been sunburned? While drinking. (laughs) He said, if it has, you're probably alcoholic. (laughs) I think the second question was, have you ever been arrested for drunk driving from the back seat of somebody else's car? (laughs) The third one I loved was, have you ever been arrested for public drunk while in jail? (laughs) He had a real list of them. We only need these two. I use them all the time. People come to me today, they say, Charlie, you think I might be alcoholic? I say, I have no idea. Let me ask you a couple questions. Have you been able to quit drinking entirely, left on your own resources? If they're a real alcoholic, they've got to say no. And then I say, do you have any control over the amount you take? After you've once started drinking, if they got if they're real alcoholic, they got to say no. And then I say, well, you're probably an alcoholic. And that's about as simple as you can make it. Now, if that be the case, you may be suffering from an illness, which only a spiritual experience will conquer. 
You know, we are very unique people. We number amongst the few people in the world today who suffer from a twofold illness that can only be overcome by a spiritual experience. We also number amongst the few people in the world today who have a terminal illness that we can come out of it in better shape than we were when we went into it if we can have this spiritual experience. We are unique people. Now, to one who feels he's an atheist or agnostic, such an experience seems impossible. But to continue as he is means disaster, especially if he's an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. To be doomed to an alcoholic death, step one, or to live on a spiritual basis, step two, are not always easy alternatives to face. But it isn't so difficult. About half our original fellowship were of exactly that type. At first, some of us tried to avoid the issue, hoping against hope we were not true alcoholics. But after a while, we had to face the fact that we must find a spiritual basis of life or else. Perhaps it's going to be that way with you. But cheer up, something like half of us thought we were atheists or agnostics, and our experience shows that you need not be disconcerted. And I had to stop right here and, and, and see, see, what is my belief as far as this God thing is concerned? And today we find there's only one of three ways that you can believe as far as God's concerned. One way is to be an atheist. Now, an atheist says there is no God. Therefore, they have no power greater than human power to turn to. The atheist would have to stand on their own two feet, run their own show. And I said, Charlie, are you an atheist? I said, no. I've always believed in some kind of God, so I'm not an atheist. I said, well, then maybe you're an agnostic. So I had to go to the dictionary and look that word up. And like Joe said, the word agnostic means without knowledge. An agnostic believes that there is a God. But since we've never tried to use God's power in our life, we've run our own show, stood on our own two feet. We've never received God's power, so we don't know that God exists. We believe in some kind of God, but we don't really know whether that's true or not. And I think that's what most of us are when we get here. Most of us get here with some belief in a God, but we have never turned to that God, and we've been running our own show and standing on our own two feet and doing our own thing. Even though we believed in God, we acted as if we did not believe in them. An agnostic is one without knowledge of God, just belief. Now, if you're an atheist or an agnostic, then the question becomes, how do you become a true believer in God? A true believer is one that knows that God exists. Don't believe it, knows it. A true believer is one who has experienced God's power in their life. And God has given them whatever they need to have a successful life. I don't think any of us get here as a true believer. Because if we knew God and experienced God's power, then we wouldn't have to come to AA to solve our problem. Most of us come here as agnostics. Now, whether we be atheist or agnostic, the question becomes, how do you get from that stage to the stage of one who is a true believer and can receive God's power in our life. Page 45, first paragraph. Lack of power, that was our dilemma. You know, if we wasn't powerless, we wouldn't be here, would we? Lack of power, that was our dilemma. We had to find a power by which we could live, and it had to be a power greater than ourselves, obviously. But where and how were we to find this power? Well... That's exactly what this book is about. Its main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself which will solve your problem. It doesn't say which will enable you to solve it or which will help you solve it. It says the main object is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself and then that power will solve the problem. And I find, interestingly enough, from page 45 on in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, we don't talk about alcohol anymore. We're through with that. 
We talk about one thing and one thing only. If you are powerless, whether you be atheist or agnostic, if you are powerless, how do you find the power? And if you can find the power, then the power will solve the problem. Okay, we're going to go to page 46 in the chapter We Agnostics. And the book says that, yes, we have agnostic temperament and have had these thoughts and experiences. Let us make haste to reassure you. We found as soon as we were able to lay aside prejudice and express even a willingness to believe in a power greater than ourselves, we commenced to get results, even though it was impossible for any of us to fully define or comprehend that power, which is God. Much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another, another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and effect the contact with him. You know, my sponsor at that time, George, saw that I had a real problem with this idea about God, and he asked me about it, and I said, yes, I am. I'm having a hard time trying to understand. And he said, well, I've noticed that. He said, why don't you do something that helped him and maybe would help, would help me? He said, why don't you go home tonight and write down on a piece of paper what you would like God to be, laying aside all that stuff you think that you know, and just write down on a piece of paper what you would like God to be. And so I went home that night, and I wrote down some things, and I'm not going to tell you what it is. <laughs> up to you. And I wrote down some things I wanted God to be, and I showed them to George, and he looked at them, and he said, well, that's good, Joe. So you can begin with that. See, I didn't know you could do that. And down in the South, you go to hell for making up your own God. <clears throat> True. You had to believe as they believed. You had to have faith in what they had faith in. If you didn't, you was going to go to hell. But George gave me permission, and I needed that permission to sit down and to say, I would like God to be these things. And he said, that's good. You can start with that and you can begin with that. And so that's exactly what I did. Where it says, much to our relief, we discovered we did not need to consider another's conception of God. Our own conception, however inadequate, was sufficient to make the approach and effect a contact with him. Now here's where we can cast aside the first old idea. The old idea that I had was that you had to believe as they believed. And they had me convinced that if you didn't believe as they believed, there's no way that you're going to get anything good when it comes to God. So I was real pleased to find out that I can cast aside that old idea, and then I can have my own conception of God. And like we said yesterday or last night, you know, I find that I've never had any problem with my own conception of anything. And you let me start believing in God the way I want to, then I've got an entirely different idea. An old idea cast aside, replaced with a new idea. Begins right here. Yeah. And the book says as soon as we admitted the possible existence of a creative intelligence, a spirit of the universe underlying the totality of things, we began to be possessed of a new sense of power and direction, provided we took other simple steps. We found that God does not make too hard a turn for those who seek Him. To us, the realm of spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to, to those who earnestly seek. It is open, we believe, to all men. See, all I had to quit doing was saying, no, there's not, no, and start seeking. Start saying, yes, maybe, and I started seeking. I said, George, you mean I need to find God? And he said, George, God's not lost. I said, it didn't take me long to figure out who was lost, but I mean... <laughs> He said, he said, it's just like the book says, it's in the seeking, it's not in the finding. All I had to do was seek. And, you know, and that's all this book is asking me to do in this chapter is asking me to seek with an open mind and to wonder and to think. And eventually God will disclose himself to me. And that's exactly what's happened. I was taught as a kid growing up that the way to God was a very narrow path, that if you strayed off either side of it, you were going to get in a hell of a shape. I was taught that God was very, very exclusive, that only those that believed as they believed would be able to make any contact with God. Those were old ideas. Now my book says we found that God does not make too hard terms with those who seek Him. To us, the realm of the Spirit is broad, roomy, all-inclusive, never exclusive or forbidding to those who earnestly seek. Old ideas cast aside, replaced with some new ideas, beginning to find this power greater than human power by changing of the old ideas to new ideas. Page 47. 
So when therefore we speak to you of God, we mean your own conception of God. This applies too to other spiritual expressions which you find in this book. Do not let any prejudice you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. Prejudice is nothing more than old ideas. Do not let any old ideas you may have against spiritual terms deter you from honestly asking yourself what they mean to you. So that's the start. This is all that we needed to commence spiritual growth, to affect our first conscious relation with God as we understood Him. And then afterward, we found ourselves accepting many things which then seemed entirely out of reach. But that was growth. But if we wished to grow, we had to begin somewhere. So we used our own conception, however limited it was. And that was a beginning for me. I needed a beginning place, and that's where I started. Now, we need to ask ourselves but one short question. Do I now believe? The agnostic has always believed in some kind of God. Or am I even willing to believe? The atheist can become willing to believe that there's some kind of God. That there's a power greater than myself. And as soon as a man can say that he does believe. The agnostic. Or is willing to believe. The atheist. We emphatically assure him that he is on his way. It has been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. And again, the actress, please be sure to read Appendix 2 on spiritual experiences. <laughs> again, they want to make real sure that we understand what they mean by those terms. He said it's been repeatedly proven among us that upon this simple cornerstone, a wonderfully effective spiritual structure can be built. Asterisk, bottom of the page, referring to the spiritual experience. So the wonderfully, wonderfully effective spiritual structure we're building is the spiritual experience or the spiritual awakening. And he said the cornerstone of that is to believe or to be willing to believe that there's a power greater than human power. We referred to that once before. The foundation of that structure was step one, which is willingness. Now then he tells us the cornerstone of that structure, step two, believing so we've already put two stones in place if we can say we're willing and yes we believe or we are willing to believe either one of the two and he said that was great news for us for we had assumed we could not make use of spiritual principles unless we accepted many things on faith which seemed difficult to believe and there has always been one of my great problems with this God thing Faith indicates surety. Faith indicates knowledge. Faith indicates after-the-fact information. And one of my problems has always been the minister would say, Son, all you got to do is have faith and everything will be all right. Well, I never could have faith because I had no knowledge of God. I didn't know for sure that God would do anything for me. The best I can possibly do is to start with belief. And there's a big difference between belief and faith. Believe me, there is. A good example of that, let's say I moved into this area here, and three or four months later I've got a problem with my automobile. I don't know a good mechanic anywhere in this area. But we'll say that you've lived here for a long time. And I assume you'll know somebody, so I come to you and I say, can you recommend a good mechanic for me? And you say, well, sure. Take your car over there to John. He'll do you a good job, and he'll charge you a reasonable price. Well, I don't know whether that's true or not. The best I can do with that information is if I believe it's strong enough, I'll take my car over there to John. And sure enough, he does a good job. He charges me a reasonable price. When I leave there, I know that he will do that. When I went there, I believed that he would do that. Now, six months from now, I have trouble with my car again. I don't ask you or anybody else where to take it. I take it right back to John. This time, I took it on faith, took it on knowledge. You can't start with faith. You can only start with belief. And that's all we have to do. We either have to believe or we become willing to believe that there's a power greater than we are and we're on the road to spiritual recovery. We don't have to know anything. Thank God step two says we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. It didn't say we came to know. 
Didn't say we had faith in that. We just came to believe. And I came to believe based upon what I've read in the book and what you told me that there's a power greater than I am can restore me to sanity. I didn't know that. I just believed that. Now, if I know that the beginning of this thing, the finding of the power is just to believe or be willing to believe, then the next thing I'm going to have to know is what procedure am I going to follow in order to find that power.